Hello there, faithful listener. You've tuned in to season seven of the Bible Explained podcast. So make sure to grab your cup of coffee because today we are going to be discussing the book of 2 Samuel. Hey guys, welcome to the Bible Explained podcast on this lovely Friday morning. I had to think about what day it is. What day is today? This has been one of the busiest weeks of my life, actually, this past um, week, because I had a friend in from out of town and she stayed with us for the entire week. And then I also had two other friends from out of town. They're from the Netherlands, actually, and we hosted them as well, but they didn't stay at the house. And then... um, I have a wedding I am in today, so this week has been in preparation for that as well. Not to mention, I still have to do my podcast episodes and get all of that done as well, so very, very busy week for me. I hope you guys have had a little bit of a quieter week than I have. Sometimes it's good to be busy, but it's not good to be too busy. So tell me how your week has gone this week and uh, what you all have been doing. And if you have a prayer request, make sure to send it my way and I will write you down in my little prayer journal and I will pray for you for the week. All right, faithful listeners, let's read 2 Samuel 20, 1 through 13 today. I'll read from the W.E.B., but make sure to grab the version of the Bible that you prefer this morning. There happened to be there a wicked fellow whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew the trumpet and said, We have no portion in David, neither have we any inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, Israel. So all the men of Israel went up from following David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah joined with their king from the Jordan, even to Jerusalem. David came to his house at Jerusalem and the king took the 10 women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house. And he put them in custody and provided them with sustenance, but didn't go into them. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. Then the king said to Amasa, Call me the men of Judah together within three days and be here present. So Amasa went to call the men of Judah together, but he stayed longer than the set time which had been appointed to him. David said to Abishai, Now Sheba the son of Bichri will do to us more harm than Absalom did. Take your Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get himself into the fortified cities and escape out of our sight. Joab's men went out after him and the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and all the mighty men. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. When they were at the great stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them. Joab was clothed in his apparel of war that he had put on, and on it was a sash with a sword fastened on his waist in the sheath. And as he went along, it fell out. Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand. So he struck him with it in the body and shed out his bowels to the ground and didn't strike him again. And he died. Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. One of Joab's young men stood by him and said, He who favors Joab and he who is for David, let him follow Joab. Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the middle of the highway. When the man saw that all the people stood still, He carried Amasa out of the highway into the field and cast a garment over him when he saw that everyone who came by him stood still. When he was removed out of the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. Man, every chapter of 2 Samuel just gets more and more exciting, like the plot just thickens, okay? And I'm here for it. So in the last chapter... Where we left off, David was finally going back to Jerusalem after being basically um, once again exiled from his home. All of Israel decided they didn't like David and they liked his son Absalom instead. So they actually anointed Absalom as their king and kicked David right out. So David went to go live in this area called Mahanium to get away from Absalom because he knew Absalom was going to try to come and kill him. But um, everything worked out in David's favor. Absalom actually fell in battle and Israel invited David back in. So the tribe of Judah was always pretty much on David's side, but Israel, the rest of the 10 tribes or 11 ish tribes of Israel were not really on David's side. Now, if you're wondering why I said 10 or 11 ish tribes of Israel, that's because, um, There were technically 12 tribes of Israel, and that includes the tribe of Judah and all the rest. But because Ephraim and Manasseh 
are both together considered the tribe of Joseph. That's where things get kind of confusing. And so scripture will say that there were 11 tribes, even though there technically was 12 tribes. So that's why scripture will switch back and forth from saying 11 or 12 tribes of Israel. But anyway, the 10 tribes of Israel, other than Judah, were not really interested in David, but they did kind of invite him back in after they saw that Absalom had fallen. So David is traveling back to Jerusalem and the entire tribe of Judah was there with David to greet him back into the city. So the rest of Israel shows up kind of later and they see that Judah is there and they're just like, Judah, what are you doing here? Like, how dare you escort your king into Jerusalem without us? And Judah was like, well, he's a close relative of us because he's also from the tribe of Judah. And then the rest of Israel got really mad when they said that. They were like, well, he's also, you know, an Israelite. So how dare you? So this uh, infighting broke out at the end of the last chapter. And now it looks like while all of this is taking place, there was this guy named Sheba, who was the son of Bikri, a Benjamite, who right then and there started a coup. And so here's what he said. He blew the trumpet and he said, we have no portion in David, neither have we any inheritance in the son of Jesse, every man to his tents, Israel. So it says that all the men of Israel went up from following David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah joined with their king from the Jordan, even to Jerusalem. So this implies that this was happening pretty much at the exact same time that David was leaving Mahanaim to come back into Jerusalem as the king of Israel again. Now the second David is back in Israel. All these problems once again arise. And this civil war is about to break out. So David, it says, gets to his home in Jerusalem. And he took his 10 concubines who he left there, who his son Absalom went and slept with. We talked about all of that. And David actually put them into custody is what it says. And he provided them with food and sustenance, but he never slept with them again. They died in widowhood is what it says. And I think scripture is implying that, um, you know, these women, this was a very sad fate for them. They probably had very little control of what had happened to them regarding Absalom. Just a very sad situation. I don't know if David should have put them in custody, but uh, he did, unfortunately. And um, these women died in widowhood is what it says. So that's just a quick thing of what happened to the concubines. But afterward now, it says that the king says to Amasa, call me the men of Judah together within three days and be here present. Now, I don't know if you guys remember who Amasa is, but Amasa was supposed to take Joab's job. So Amasa was actually um, Absalom's commander. And Amasa was related to both Absalom and David. But David fired Joab because I don't know if he was tired of him or what happened there, but he was... Uh, sick of Joab and decided to place Amasa, Absalom's commander, in Joab's place. Possibly to try to relieve tensions to not start a civil war. But of course, that didn't really work anyway. So he says to Amasa, call the men of Judah together within three days and be here present. But Amasa doesn't come on time. It says that Amasa did go to call the men of Judah together, but he stayed longer than the set time that was appointed to him. So something happened that Amasa just didn't get there on time. I don't know if he was dilly dallying or if it just took longer than he thought it would take or something happened along the way that he couldn't get there in time. But Amasa did not get there at the set amount of time. And so David is starting to panic because he's like, OK, I just got to Jerusalem and there's this whole new problem on my hands. This Sheba guy is causing all sorts of trouble and is trying to, you know, start a civil war the second I get back. And Amasa is not here. So we need to do something. So it says that David says to Abishai, who is Joab's brother, he says, now Sheba, the son of Bikri, will do us more harm than Absalom did. Take your Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get himself to the fortified cities and escape out of our sight. So David, notice that he doesn't call Joab, but he calls Abishai to do this for him. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But uh, anyway, he tells Abishai, take the men you got and pursue after 
this Sheba guy so that he does not get to the fortified cities where we can't reach him. But Joab decides that this is his chance to shine again. It says Joab's men went out after him and the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. So Joab decides that he is still the commander of David's army. (laughs) Joab, in his mind, never got fired from this position. He's like, nope, I am definitely still the commander of David's army. I will be the commander until I decide I don't want to be the commander anymore. Remember how I said that Joab's kind of a wild card? He certainly was. So Joab's back on the job. He decides he's David's commander again. He he really had very little respect of David. You can kind of see that um, Joab didn't have a lot of respect for him. He just kind of did whatever he really wanted to do. And so now Joab's going out. It says that they get to this stone, which is in Gibeon, and Amasa finally gets there. So Amasa was super delayed, but he meets the army at the stone in Gibeon. It says that Joab was clothed in his apparel of war that he had put on, and there was this sash with a sword fastened on his waist in its sheath, and as he went along, it fell out. So, I don't know if this was an accidental sword falling out, or if Joab planned all of this, but somehow Joab's sword falls out of its sheath. Okay? And this happens right as a massa is there to greet the army. So Joab nonchalantly picks up his sword with his left hand and goes to greet Amasa, pretending like they are friends. And Joab is, you know, holding his sword as he goes up to Amasa. Amasa probably saw the sword fall out of uh, Joab's sheath. And so he didn't think anything of it. So Joab reaches out with his right hand to kiss Amasa on his face. It says he grabbed his beard to kiss Amasa. And Amasa took no heed of the sword that was in Joab's hand. So he struck him with it in the body and shed out his bowels to the ground and didn't strike him again, and he died. Amasa didn't think anything of the sword in Joab's left hand. And that's because it's very likely that Joab was not left-handed. Men would often fight with their right hands, and so this caught Amasa off guard that Joab had his sword in his left hand. He didn't think that Joab was going to kill him, especially since Joab and Amasa would have been related also. I think they were like cousins or something because Joab was related to David. So Joab and Amasa would have been potentially related as well, I think, if I'm understanding correctly. But anyway, Amasa didn't think that Joab was going to kill him, but Joab used the opportunity to get Amasa out of the way so that Joab could get his job back as commander of David's army. On top of this, Joab probably also thought of Amasa as a traitor, which he kind of was because Amasa was uh, Absalom's commander. And we know that Joab did not like traitors. Okay. Both Joab and Abishai specifically disliked traitors. So anyway, Joab kills Amasa. It says that he disemboweled him. And he laid there in his own blood, is what it says. But he did die. And the rest of the men who saw this very blatant murder happen actually are like, okay, let's follow Joab. He's clearly the commander here. He just won this little battle. So his men said, he who favors Joab and he who is for David, let him follow Joab. Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the middle of the highway. And the men who were with Joab stood still because Amasa's body was there. And this would have been very distracting for the people of Israel because of the the rules about dead bodies. So they couldn't move. They were like, we have to get this body out of the middle of the road. Like we want to follow after Joab, but this is against the Old Testament law. So it says that when Joab's men saw how the people were unable to detach themselves from this body. That was when they decided to move Amasa's body out from the middle of the highway into a field and they covered Amasa's body with a cloth is what it says. After this, the men were willing to follow after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bikri. I think that this story 
kind of shows Joab's character a little bit more. Like you can kind of understand, you can kind of understand some of why Joab killed the previous men that he did kill, right? Um, he killed Absalom because Absalom was in complete rebellion and was also uh, trying to kill King David. You can kind of understand why Joab killed him, but Joab has become so arrogant in this chapter that he kind of thinks he can get away with anything he wants to get away with. And uh, nothing's ever going to be done about it. David is never going to stop him. And Joab probably got this opinion of David way, way back in like chapter two of Second Samuel, I think it was, when Joab killed Abner. David did nothing about it. And Joab got away with it. And then you can see how Joab's murderous intent is just getting uh, worse and worse and worse throughout all of these chapters. Now it seems like Joab is killing somebody every other chapter. So Joab was getting very arrogant and nobody was doing anything to stop him, including David, who should have been a better judge than he was. That was one of David's primary roles as the king was to be a judge. And David had a very, very hard time judging his family members. And so maybe that's why he let Joab get away with this for so many years. But there's a verse that Solomon wrote that says something along the lines of, when a criminal does not get punished quickly, he thinks it's okay to go on committing more crimes. I think that is a very good verse for people who have kids, but I think it's also a very good verse about how governments should be run. You can see how many issues are caused when people are not punished quickly. Like even here in America, oftentimes crimes go unpunished for lengthy periods of time. And then those criminals go on to hurt and kill and mistreat more and more people. But the moral of this story is that Joab is getting more and more arrogant. And I think he thinks that he is not going to get punished for anything that he does. And honestly, while David is alive, that is absolutely true. But people will always get punished for what they have done. And Joab is also one of them. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you did, make sure to write a review on whatever listening platform you are on. And also to tell people that the Bible Explained podcast exists. Now, there isn't going to be a Friday episode for much longer. I explained that to everybody on Wednesday, that I'm going to be dropping Friday episodes. So if you did not catch why I'm doing that, I explained it on Wednesday. That's not going to be until season eight hits, which is approximately next month. I'll keep you guys updated as the date gets closer and closer. Faithful listeners, have a fantastic rest of your Friday. I will see you all on Monday. Happy weekend and God bless. <laughs>